Nintendo's quarterly investor updates giving their financial results are always fascinating treasure troves for budding Nintendo forecasters and today's revelations out of Japan are no exception. Buried in these obscure graphs and tables of numbers are some really shocking little nuggets that I expect to have huge consequences on the way Nintendo chart their course going forward. Join me as I look at four shocking details of Nintendo's financial report. Firstly, let's just look at their quarterly unit sales. Compare Q4, that's the quarter to the end of March 2023, to the previous year's quarter ending March 2022. The numbers of consoles sold are definitely down, but not by a huge amount. And interestingly, the Switch Lite is having something of a resurgence. My hunch is that anyone who needs to replace a Switch will do so now with the OLED, but anyone who wants a higher spec model but doesn't actually need to replace their machine is now more likely to hold off for newer technology around the corner. This might sound like a bad thing for Nintendo, but it isn't necessarily as dire as it sounds. President Shantaro Furukawa mentioned at a previous investor's Q&A that the margins on the OLED were less than the light and the OG Switch. In other words, they make more profit per unit on light and the original Switch, and while I don't know their production costs, it seems to me that the end of the chip shortage and its replacement by something of a chip glut must have significantly shrunk production costs as well. Therefore, while overall sales are somewhat diminished, I'm not overly concerned about hardware sales. The software dip is noticeable, but remember the context. January 2022 had Pokemon Legends Arceus, which, even though it didn't quite match the numbers of the mainline Pokemon titles, was still a massive game, and it was only supported by a bevy of great titles like Triangle Strategy and Kirby and the Forgotten Land. The same quarter this year had Fire Emblem Engage, Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe, Metroid Prime Remastered, and a Bayonetta spin-off. Even though Engage and Remastered especially are games that I personally have had an absolute whale of a time with, none of these are huge scale releases on the scale of Pokemon Legends Arceus or even Forgotten Land, and I think Nintendo can feel some relief that their software sales continue to show a good deal of resilience. Second, it's always worth bearing in mind just how geared towards first-party content Nintendo is. I admit, I'm completely in this category. Even though I grew up playing mainly Sega consoles, even then it was the first party Sega and Nintendo games I tended to buy my systems for, and indeed there are hardly any Switch games that I have significant time in that aren't by the big N. I just don't find the appeal in most other games, which is why I've never really been swayed by PlayStation, Xbox and PC gaming. Evidently many people agree as 85% of sales being first party titles in the Christmas period is just eye-watering, especially when you consider that their major Mario game that quarter was a third party title. It was from Ubisoft. What this means is that Nintendo really doesn't have to pay a blind bit of notice to what any other company says or wants. I'm sure they'll want to keep building these bridges with other third party developers. Hubris is never a good look, and the way the Wii U alienated third parties meant that the Switch initially struggled in this field. But you can see why Nintendo would feel that securing a strong lineup of first party games is their overwhelming priority before giving any consideration to the needs of third party devs. Okay, here's another fascinating graph showing the way that the digital trend is really taking over as the primary transmission method for games. I'll chuck a link at the end to a previous video I made about the rise of the digital first releases. I noticed Nate at Nintendo Prime making similar comments the other day as well. Going by the numbers, it looks like the audience is well on the way to going full digital. I must admit, one of the things that often holds me back from digital is that the prices are often lower physically than digitally. Nintendo really aren't at all competitive with their digital offerings, even though the margins they make on digital games must be substantially higher. Basically, they've reached this point while barely even trying. If they could put some muscle behind it, I think they could do a lot better, but I do wonder when or if these numbers will reach a ceiling. The dip in the Christmas quarter reflects not just the fact that digital games are notoriously hard to wrap and shove under a Christmas tree, but that a lot of families like having physical media that can be passed from child to child and isn't locked to a single console. If Nintendo could address the value proposition of buying a game, for example by linking games to family accounts, they might really clean up. But then they might also lose sales on people double dipping so each child has their own Mario Kart to play competitively. We'd need more detailed numbers to know whether it's worth doing, but I feel like there's a lot of elbow room for Nintendo to experiment in this field. 
then my favourite part is the game sales and particularly the lifetime game sales charts. They rank them in the tens of thousands sold, so Pokemon Scarlet and Violet sold 2,210 ten thousands of units or 22.1 million games. Not bad for a notoriously buggy game in a franchise already very heavily exposed on the console. I can't see any reason to think they'll move from their breakneck three-year cycles of development and that 2025 won't feature Gen 10 Pokemon. And of course, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe continues to wow, soaring past 53 million and showing no signs of stopping. I can't begin to guess where this one will end up. But look at Switch Sports Go. I'm not surprised because it's routinely in the charts and it is, to be fair, a little cheaper than other games. But given that it is, to me at least, one of the laziest games Nintendo have ever put out. With too few and not very satisfying modes, it doesn't seem to have hurt it a bit at all. I think there's a lot of potential in the sports franchise, although the disappointment of Switch Sports has made me much more cautious about jumping into another one. Another surprise is Mario Strikers Battle League, another game that was disappointingly bare bones, it still reached a pretty good level of sales, not dissimilar from Tennis Aces and Golf Super Rush early on, although of course the install base is vastly bigger now, so it's not a very fair comparison. I have such mixed feelings as I really love the core strikers mechanics and had a brilliant time with the game for about 10 hours until I realised that basically there was nothing else to do in it. Also, check out Mario Party Superstars. It's not quite up there with Super Mario Party, but it's had a third as long to get the sales. Mario Party really seems to have established itself as one of Nintendo's quietest money printing machines. Then there's Metroid Prime Remaster, which has crossed 1 million, even though it was only out for a few weeks. I'm not sure how I feel. I kind of wanted more, but it is a short period of time and hopefully we'll see more sales continuing to trickle in. Its sales aren't too far off Xenoblade Chronicles 3, which has been out a lot longer, though if that game still churns out sequels, I don't see why Summer shouldn't keep going and going as well. I think Xenoblade and Metroid both count as real Jewel in the Crown franchises. However, while Xenoblade is more popular in Japan, Metroid has always been more Western facing. While Nintendo is a Japanese studio and does focus mainly on Japan, I hope they'll continue to see the value in Samus Aran as well. One thing that really delights me is the success of 3D Kirby. Kirby and the Forgotten Land was an absolutely joyous game and the absolutely mega sales on this one hopefully will bode well for more of the Pink Puff Ball in 3D in the future. Now look, I'm sure there will be more revelations coming up as the Q&A details are released, but are there any things that you've spotted that interest you? Chuck me a like and then pop a comment below explaining anything you noticed. Also, check out the video here where I look at the prospect of digital first games being a major part of Nintendo's future. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for your wonderful feedback on my videos. 